welcome to the Particular Baptist Podcast. My name is Daniel Vincent. I'm here with my co-host, Sean Cheatham. Um, and we have a special guest with us today. Pastor Tom Hicks from Clinton, Louisiana is joining us um, to talk about our topic today. Um, thank you for joining us, Pastor Hicks. We appreciate it. Absolutely. It's a joy to be here. Uh, Pastor Hicks is senior pastor of First Baptist Church in Clinton, Louisiana. Um, he received his theological education from the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary. Um, his dissertation is on the doctrine of justification and theologies of Richard Baxter and Benjamin Keach. Sounds like some really good, uh, good rich stuff there. Uh, and he's also on one of the board of directors for Covenant Baptist Theological Seminary. And Sean, I was just telling him that you go there uh, oh, currently. Yep. I've got a, I've got Greek class after this, actually. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, Pastor Hicks, if you want to tell us a little bit about your background uh, before we dive into our questions, that would be great. Yeah, absolutely. I've been pastoring here at First Baptist Church of Clinton, Louisiana, for four years. And before that, I was an associate pastor in Montgomery, Alabama, for nine years. Uh, my wife, Joy, and I have been married for 18 years, and we have four children, uh, three girls and a boy. The Lord has saved two of them, and we're praying that he'll save the other two as well. Amen. Amen. All right, Sean, if you want to take us into our topic. Yeah, so today we're actually going to be talking about theonomy. Um, theonomy has been gaining popularity with, within Baptist circles, uh, even though it originally comes out of a more of a Presbyterian context, but it's been gaining uh, in Baptist circles, being promoted by big names such as Jeff Durbin of Apology at Church. And uh, just to give a definition of theonomy, it's the idea that the judicial laws of the Mosaic Covenant, or at least their general equity, are binding on nations today, and that the church has an obligation to call uh, the civil magistrate to enforce those laws. So for uh, to give an example, um, ad adultery is a stonable offense in the Mosaic Covenant. Uh, therefore, the church, under a theonomic understanding, should be calling on the state to implement the death penalty for adultery. Um, the idea underpinning theonomy is uh, that the standard of all things must be the word of God. Therefore, um, how we as Christians should interact in the area of civil ethics must be governed uh, by that as well. Uh, while we can at least appreciate the strong emphasis on the word of God as the standard, ultimately, I don't think the theonomous use of the judicial law is correct in a new covenant context. And we'll get into that as the discussion goes on. Um, yeah, and I think we we start to see this um, this resurgence, and that kind of I think leads into our first question. You know, along those lines of implementing judicial law of the Old Testament into today's society. So, um, Pastor Hicks, why do you think that theonomy has really made a resurgence um, in the church today? I think it's because the whole of Western civilization has been and is losing its Christian roots. The United States is currently in the midst of a massive collapse of the social order, which has been based on the Judeo-Christian worldview and ethic. Um, so we've recently seen this in the emergency of critical theory, which is a pagan ideology uh, coming out of radical feminism that pretends to be a standard of justice for society. And so theonomists, they want to reconstruct American society based on God's law. They want to build a just and equitable civilization based on scripture, free from governmental tyranny and oppression. And it's a very noble ideal, uh, what they want to see happen. I believe there's uh, been a resurgence of interest in theonomy because it's, it's easy. It's an easy, ready-made answer to the problems of society. And the way to fix America's problems is to embrace the ideal society prescribed by God in the old covenant. And I would have to say, we agree with theonomists on one major point. We agree that the law of God is the final authority for all of life. There is one transcendent law of God uh, that supersedes all other laws. And we agree that Gentile civil governments are required to submit to God's law and they must rule in accordance with it. But we disagree with theonomists about which of God's old covenant laws are transcendent and apply to the Gentile states. And so our disagreement with her uh, theonomy is fundamentally a hermeneutical disagreement. Yeah, that that makes a lot of sense, and it I like how you put it with that it's a it's an easy solution to the problem, um, at least it appears to be from their side, um, mm -hmm. because it, I think there's a sense where we know this this world is not 
all that there is, you know, as Paul says in Romans 8, the creation groans, right? So we're groaning under sin, we're groaning under the curse, and we want to see perfect justice, and we want it now. But right. um, yes, and I think that that's where that kind of stems from. And then that leads to applying a bad covenant theology, like you said, hermeneutics. Um, just having a bad covenant theology, uplifting the law to a place where it should not be lifted. Although noble in its in its uh, desires and intentions, it just leads to all kinds of problems. That's right. Yeah, it is. It is the backlash against the 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 mainstream view where everybody's downplaying the law. Obviously, uh, we as conservative Christians do want to uphold the law and use it as our standard, but um, we need to make sure that it's being applied appropriately. Amen. All right. So moving on to our next question, um, Pastor X, what is the confessional Baptist position um, on the application of God's judiciary laws in society? Well, to quote the Second London Confession, uh, chapter 19, paragraph 4, says, and it's speaking to the nation of Israel, about the nation of Israel, it says, to them also he gave sundry judicial laws which expired together with the state of that people not obliging any now by virtue of that institution, their general equity only being of moral use. And so that's a very balanced statement on the judicial law of the old covenant it has two sides to it. On the one hand, it says that the judicial law has completely expired. So the old covenant, which established the nation state of Israel has expired. And that means that the judicial laws no longer bind anyone. But on the other hand, as a balancing statement to that, the confession teaches that the general equity of Israel's judicial laws is of moral use. Now, just as a, a note here, some, some of today's editions of the Second London Confession say this. It says that their general equity is of modern use, but that's an error. The original says the general equity is of moral use, and it gives you sort of a clue as to what it's talking about. What it means is that the judicial law is still useful today in, in our lives, in the church, and the civil government, but there's a great deal, has been a great deal of debate about what the phrase general equity means. Uh, the Presbyterian Westminster Confession uses the same phrase, general equity, and the Presbyterians have been debating this among themselves, but really uh, the, the history of it's clear. Uh, if you study the old Puritan divines, there's no doubt as to what general equity means. John Calvin and the Puritans uh, knew what they were talking about. And the, the uh, editors, the framers of the confession knew what they were talking about when they wrote the term. What it refers to is natural law. Natural law is the moral law summarized in the Ten Commandments. So something of uh, the, the general equity of judicial law is the moral principle that's in any given judicial law. Only the moral part of judicial law continues. And so general equity does not mean, as some seem to think, that it's the general principle of any given judicial law that is still binding. So if you can just kind of discern whatever general principles behind it, that is what continues into the new covenant that our entire, the new Testament period. That's just not true. It's the moral aspect, whatever moral aspect is underneath the judicial law is what is binding and what uh, continues. So we, I, I would say we need to understand there's an important order here, though. Uh, the theonomists assume that the old covenant judicial law is perpetual and moral. That's where they begin. But we believe, and our confession teaches, that judicial law is abrogated unless the Ten Commandments teach us that there's something moral in it. So we begin with moral law, looking at the judicial law to see what's moral in there. We don't begin with judicial law and then decide what's moral from judicial law. You see what I'm saying? So it starts with moral law. So that's a confessional Baptist view of the judicial laws. That's a very interesting way to put it. I've never thought of that because I think we, we tend to go to the judicial laws and try to pull out what's behind it. Because we're like, well, okay, there's general equity here, so it must be talking about the specific law when it's actually the Ten Commandments, which undergird those laws. Exactly. Um, that's right. That's a very that's a very good way to put it. Um, Sean, do you have anything you want to add to that? I was just going to bring up uh, an example, I think, an excellent example of how uh, an Old Testament um, judicial law is being used now in a, a moral context. And that comes from uh, 1 Timothy 5.19. 
and it's uh, and against an elder received not an accusation, but before two or three witnesses. Um, in the Old Testament context, you weren't supposed to uh, execute judgment against someone except on the charge of two or three witnesses. Um, that wasn't specifically against an elder. That was just applied across the board, whether it be in the case of somebody's accused of adultery or, or whatnot. Here in the New Testament, we see it, it that same principle still being applied, although it's applied in a different way. Don't admit a charge against um, uh, an elder without uh, two or three witnesses. So um, there is a sense in which we can apply the judicial law, but it has to have a, a moral backing, essentially. And the moral backing there is the ninth commandment. You know, do not bear false witness. Mm -hmm. And so that is, I mean, that's a clear, not only does the New Testament repeat that explicitly, so we know that it carries through, you can see very clearly that, that the ground of that is moral as the ninth commandment is moral. Yeah, that's exactly right. Um, now, how would that apply to, I guess this is, this is kind of off the cuff, but um, how would that apply to rules that might be grounded in creation? You know, like um, a man is not to dress like a woman or homo rules about homosexuality that aren't necessarily explicitly given in the Ten Commandments. Yeah, well, we would say that the Ten Commandments are a summary of moral law. So, you know, if you, if you take out, say, you know, the Westminster Larger Catechism, you can see how the divines kind of collated tons of biblical text showing how uh, there are various facets, aspects, and there's a fullness to the Ten Commandments. It's not right on the surface. And so we, we certainly need the whole Bible to help us understand what the Ten Commandments are. Um, and yet it's, it is the moral law that is transcendent, that is written on our consciences, uh, we're made in God's image. Uh, and so that's that, that moral law alone transcends all covenants. And you could even say that the moral law was even a, I wouldn't say established at creation, but instituted at creation when it was written on Adam's heart um, as chapter four teaches in the confession as well. Yeah, we, we'd say moral law is part of God's, it's parts the wrong word. It's an aspect of God's moral character. Mm. So it's, yeah. it's eternal. It's in God himself. And so when he created Adam, yes, in the image of God, Adam was made to reflect his moral character in that way. Mm. Amen. So is it, so I guess along those lines of, if it's confessional, is it consistent to be Baptist and be a theonomist? <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, theonomy <laughs> is, is uh, consistent with a paedo-baptist hermeneutic, but it is not consistent with a Baptist hermeneutic. Paedo-Baptists tend to think of the elements of the Old Testament as continuing into the time of the New Testament unless specifically abrogated by the New Testament. Mm. So infant baptism is a perfect example of that. They say children receive the sign of circumcision in the Old Covenant. Therefore, children should receive the sign of baptism in the New Covenant uh, because the New Testament has never forbidden it. Uh, so since uh, that's, how, that's how they think. Ironically, uh, this is the same mistake dispensationalists make, isn't it? The dispensationalists believe yep. that the pr promises that God made to Israel cannot be fulfilled in Christ, but must be literally fulfilled in the future for nat national Israel. So both Pado baptists and dispensationalists together allow for a kind of Old Testament priority, and they don't allow the New Testament to consistently interpret the old and for the old to be consistently fulfilled in Christ in the new. We see the same logic in theonomy. Theonomists say that Israel's judicial laws have binding authority for all nations unless they are specifically abrogated by the New Testament. Baptists, on the other hand, uh, try to hold a consistent hermeneutic of New Testament priority. So the New Testament teaches that the moral law of the Old Testament is perpetually binding, as we've talked about, but that laws tied to particular Old Testament covenants have been abolished with the coming of Christ and the passing away of the Old Covenant. Baptists view Old Covenant Israel, her positive laws, her history as a type, all as a type of Christ and of the church in him, because that's the way the New Testament talks about Israel and the Old. And so Baptists deny that Israel's judicial laws are the paradigm for the church or for the state. The judicial laws of Israel served a specific purpose, which has been fulfilled with the coming of Christ. And now they're abrogated. Mm, yeah, that, that's right. The, the um, Our Presbyterian brothers do tend to read from backwards to forwards instead of the other way around. Um, but what's interesting is, 
you had the the update to the Westminster Confession in the 18th century, which kind of started to become more Baptistic in its uh, relation of church and state at that point. Um, I don't think they like to talk about that very much. They, but... they do not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Sean, do you have anything else you want to add? Uh, not on that question, I don't think. Okay. So why is the concept of theonomy then unbiblical? Um, it, you know, we've looked at it from a historical perspective. Why is it really from a fundamentally biblical uh, perspective? Why is it not consistent? I want to give you seven reasons that I think it's unbiblical. So this is sort of the bulk of my argument here for, for why, why theonomy is wrong. But first, Gentile nations are not, and they never were, under the old covenant. And therefore, the laws of, that are peculiar to the old covenant do not bind Gentile nations. So Gentile nations are, are under natural law, which is the moral law. The Bible explicitly teaches us this. It says in Romans 2.14, for when the Gentiles who do not have the law by nature do what the law requires, they are a law to themselves, even though they do not have the law. They show that the work of the law is written in their hearts. And so here we see Gentile nations, the, all Gentiles, they have the work of God's moral law, natural law written on their hearts. And you can also see this in that when God judges uh, the Gentile nations in the Old Testament, he never judges them for violating Old Covenant judicial law. You can see it in the prophets, that the reason he judges them is because they violated moral law, as summarized in the Ten Commandments. Uh, they only incur judgment for moral violations. So uh, Gentile nations are not and were never under the Old Covenant. That's the first argument against theonomy. Second, theonomy doesn't acknowledge that the Old Covenant as a whole together with all of its laws has been abolished. This is what the Bible teaches, <clears throat> that the whole old covenant has been abolished. Hebrews seven twelve says, for when there is a change in the priesthood, there is necessarily a change in the law as well. Hebrews seven eighteen says, a former commandment is set aside because of its weakness and uselessness. Hebrews eight thirteen, in speaking of a new covenant, he makes the first one obsolete. Hebrews 10, 9, he abolishes the first in order to establish the second. Ephesians 2, verses 14 and 15 says that Christ has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances. And so the, the old covenant as a whole has been fulfilled in Christ and is abolished. Now, again, just so there's no lack of clarity, the moral law that's underneath all of these laws, the aspect or aspects of moral law that are in any of these laws, those are binding. That's, that continues all the way through. So we don't just throw out the Old Testament's laws. We definitely read them. We study them. We try to understand them and discern what's moral in it. But the covenant has been abolished. And theonomy really doesn't have a, a, a consistent understanding of that whatsoever. Um, a third reason that theonomy is unbiblical is that it, it doesn't understand that the judicial laws of Israel were only to be practiced within the land of Canaan. You cannot separate Israel's judicial law from the land of Canaan. The old covenant law was given to the old covenant people who were to keep the old covenant law in the old covenant land. Deuteronomy 4.14 says, And the Lord commanded me at that time to teach you statutes and rules that you might do them in the land that you're going over to possess. And in context, uh, those statutes and rules are actually put in contrast to the 10 words or the 10 commandments. And so they're, they're, it's different than the 10 commandments. And to give you just one example of this, that the law was to be practiced in the land, think of the law of the parapet. Uh, Deuteronomy 22.8 says, when you build a new house, you shall make a parapet for your roof that you may not bring the guilt of blood upon your house if anyone should fall from it. Now, this only makes sense because the land of Israel is holy. According to the old covenant, blood guilt defiles the land and results in the expulsion of the people. And so this, this law of the parapet, which is a judicial law of the old covenant, the, the warning is blood guilt, which has to do with the land. It's tied to the land. I'm not saying there's nothing moral underneath the law of the parapet. I'm saying the law itself, that that judicial law 
uh, is tied to the land. Deuteronomy 19.10 warns that if blood guilt comes upon the land, the guilt of the blood shall be shed upon the people. So that's the third thing. Uh, these judicial laws were given to be practiced in the land of Canaan. A fourth reason that theonomy is unbiblical is that it misunderstands the reason for the death penalties in the Old Covenant judicial law. And this is really huge. This is significant. Um, but before we get into that specifically, we have to understand that the covenant of common grace does establish the death penalty for murder. That's part of moral law. In Genesis 9, 6, the Noahic covenant of common grace says, whoever sheds the blood of man by man shall his blood be shed for God made man in his own image. That's a transcendent principle that the punishment must fit the crime. I would argue that uh, the death penalty for murder is moral law. It's lex talionis, an eye for an eye, equal weights and measures and justice. Uh, that is a transcendent moral principle. But other Old Testament death penalties are really tied to Old Covenant worship, believe it or not. I, be I, I believe, uh, and I, I'm going to try to prove that to you. You'll often see the phrase devoted to destruction or devoted to the ban, which refers to the death penalty. And I want to give you uh, a, an example of this from Deuteronomy 13. Uh, verses 12 to 16, where we see this phrase, devoted to destruction. It says, beginning in verse 12, If you hear in one of your cities, which the Lord your God is giving you to dwell there, that certain worthless fellows have gone out among you and have drawn away the inhabitants of their city, saying, Let us go and serve other gods, which you have not known. Then you shall inquire and make search and ask diligently. And behold, if it be true and certain that such an abomination has been done among you, you shall surely put the inhabitants of that city to the sword, devoting it to destruction. All who are in it and its cattle with the edge of the sword, you shall gather all its spoil into the midst of its open square and burn the city and all its spoil with fire as a whole burnt offering to the Lord your God. It shall be a heap forever. It shall not be built again. So what that old covenant judicial law is saying is that if a city comes under the influence of idolaters, first, there's to be a careful search and inquiry. We want to make sure we're not lying about this, that this is a true thing, that this is happening. But if it's found to be true that the whole city has come under the influence of idolaters, then that whole city is to be put to death together with cattle. Now, that should already be an indication of something. Together with the cattle, and it's all to be a whole burnt offering to the Lord. This is not just a matter of moral justice. It's an offering to God. In fact, I would argue it's a, it's a law about holy war and Israel's possession of the holy land. It's a ceremonial purification. Um, now, at this point, some people might even wonder how that could be just for, for that to be. They might wonder, how's that a just judicial law in any context? Well, I would argue that it would not be a just penalty in our context. It would not be a just penalty if we just wanted to practice this law. The only way this is a just penalty is that God commanded it by way of covenant. God has a right to command that any sinner be put to death. We all deserve to die. And he had a reason for doing it here. It had to do with the purification of the land. It was a typological, uh, it was typological of heavenly purification, but also a, a foreshadowing of judgment day. Um, the New Testament seems to teach the death penalties of the Old Testament are really types of eternal condemnation. Uh, listen to Hebrews 10, 28. It says, if anyone who has set aside the law of Moses dies without mercy on the evidence of two or three witnesses. So that's the Old Testament, Old Covenant death penalty. Uh, but then it says, how much worse punishment do you think will be deserved by the one who has trampled underfoot the Son of God and has profaned the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified and outraged the spirit of grace. For we know him who said, vengeance is mine, I will repay. So in other words, under the old covenant, the penalty for breaking the law was physical death. But the New Testament teaches us if you don't have Christ, the penalty for breaking the law is eternal condemnation. There seems to be uh, a comparison, or, or rather as you're moving from the old to the new, that the old death penalties were types, really, of eternal condemnation. Um, and for this, I would recommend Vern Poitras's book, The Shadow of Christ and the Law of Moses. Here's, here's my copy. 
Uh, I think it illustrates this very well. I'm, I, he, he argues this way. I don't agree with everything in that book, uh, but I think it's a good resource to have. So to sum up, I believe it would be unjust to try to apply old covenant death penalties in a Gentile nation. It was perfectly just for Israel to put people to death for all sorts of reasons, because God has a right to command death of any sinner. But we have no right to require death of someone unless the punishment fits the crime. That only seems to be the case for murder, uh, according to the scripture. So I would argue my fourth point that theonomy misunderstands the special reasons for old covenant death penalties. I only dealt with one, but we could actually deal with all of them. I think they all fit under this kind of explanation. Uh, Fifth, theonomy fails to understand that old covenant law was intentionally harsh to preserve the line of promise. So the nation of Israel was largely an unbelieving nation. They needed severe laws and they needed a harsh legal system to chasten the people, to preserve them as a nation until Christ would come from them. And I'm getting these ideas from various places, but I'm thinking particularly of Galatians 3.19, which is key here. It says, why then the law? It was added because of transgressions until the offspring should come to whom the promise had been made. And then similarly in Galatians 3.24, so then the law was our guardian until Christ came in order that we might be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. So what this is saying is a harsh old covenant law was given because of the sins of the nation of Israel. It was given to them as a nation to chasten them, to keep them from destroying themselves until Christ came from them. Uh, Similarly with this, you remember at the Jerusalem council, a certain group of people wanted the church to practice circumcision. And Acts 15.10 says, Now, therefore, why are you putting God to the test by placing a yoke on the neck of the disciples that neither our fathers nor we have been able to bear? So the covenant of circumcision, if it's if it's part of the new covenant, if we are if it's part of the saving covenant, if the if the laws, the commands of the covenant of circumcision with all of its fullness is part of the way that we walk faithfully in in our salvation before the Lord, the Bible says that's a heavy burden. It's a heavy burden. Now that Christ has come, there is no reason for such a harsh law with harsh penalties. The old covenant has been fulfilled and abolished with the coming of Christ because he was the goal of the old covenant. He is the whole purpose of the old covenant that began with God's promise to Abraham, uh, or rather actually began Genesis 3.15, but we see it first uh, manifest fully or in a clear certain way with the covenant of circumcision with Abraham and then going on to Moses, the end of all that and David and the end of all that is Jesus. So that's my fifth biblical argument against uh, theonomy. My sixth argument is that in each case, when the new new Testament applies one of the judicial laws of the old covenant, it applies the law's general equity to the church and never to the government of a Gentile nation. This is very important because if we believe the New Testament teaches us how to interpret and use the Old Testament, then we need to pay attention to how the New Testament applies judicial laws. And you will never find a single New Testament example where an Old Testament judicial law is applied to a Gentile government. But we have examples of judicial laws being applied to the church. I want to give you just two of them. First Timothy 5. Verses 17 and 18 says, let the elders who rule well be considered worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in preaching and teaching. And then verse 18 quotes the judicial law, says, for the scripture says, you shall not muzzle an ox when it treads out the grain. And where does that come from? That comes from Deuteronomy 25.4. So it's a judicial law of the old covenant, but Paul is not applying it to a Gentile nation. He's applying it to the church, He's saying you pay your pastors properly because of this judicial law in the old covenant. Another example, and this is a very important one, comes from 1 Corinthians 5.13, where Paul is discussing church discipline. And he says, purge the evil person from among you. That's from Deuteronomy 13, 5, 17, 7, verse 12, and on and on. It's all through the Old Covenant. It's the penalty. And in the Old Covenant judicial law, purging the evil person from among you referred to the death penalty. But in the New Covenant, 
the general equity of that is applied to excommunicating people from the church covenant. So if we allow the New Testament to teach us how to interpret Old Testament judicial laws, then we will think of them as applying to the church first, not primarily to Gentile civil governments. So that's the sixth point. My seventh point is uh, the reason that the uh, theonomy is unbiblical is that is really kind of summarizing all the rest. I would argue that theonomy's central mistake is thinking that God gave the judicial law of Israel as a universal norm for all nations. That's the fundamental error. Uh, and and I, I just want to reiterate again that the moral law of the Old Covenant is a universal norm for all nations. We should use the Old Testament to help us understand moral law. But positive aspects of Old Covenant law had many different purposes, and all of them were unique to the Old Covenant. Just to summarize here kind of what we've already thought about, talked about here, the judicial law was tied to the land, to ceremonial worship, to the preservation of the line of promise. Some of the judicial laws were simply designed to create a distinct culture for Israel that separated them from the nations, and all of the positive laws of the Old Covenant were tied to the typological character of the Old Covenant and to its unique place in redemptive history. And so those are seven reasons I think theonomy is unbiblical. Oh, lots of good stuff in there. Um, what's interesting when you tie it back to the land, if going back to dispensationalism, if dispensationalists think that the land has to be, or at least um, Israel has to regain the land, then wouldn't that mean that the old covenant would have to come with it if they're to I be consistent? So. Absolutely. Theonomists ought to have a place for the land in their theology. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't think uh, brothers like John MacArthur, who is who are dispensational, would hold that the Old Covenant would have to come back with it. I guess you, there is an inconsistency in their um, thinking at that point. I think so. Um, and then going back to establishing that the, the Old Testament is preeminently more than the New from their point of view, I think you see this um, in brothers like Jeff Durbin. They like to go to places like Psalm 2, they kind of follow the the thinking of Greg Bonson um, and, you know, saying, well, you must kiss the uh, kiss the son lest he be angry. And, and they establish from that Jesus is king. And therefore, you know, nations need to be under the law of God in that sense. Um, you know, that, that it's an improper hermeneutic. I mean, based on what you've just said, there's so much there in scripture that can lead us to have a proper understanding of the law of God and um, and its application for Christians today. And it, and I think it's a struggle that we have because we, we want justice, we want true peace in this world, and we, I think Christians have a true desire to see the law of God acted out um, perfectly in society, and we want people to submit to that. But um, we can't isolate those passages from the rest of Scripture. We have to let Scripture speak for itself. Um, and I think you can, you might even at some point, maybe even become legalistic if you take this thinking too um, too far, law can become more than gospel. And then we're just simply getting um, unbelievers to submit to a specific law, but they haven't actually come to know the one who kept it perfectly. Um, and, and I think that's a, I think that's a danger from this from this view. Yeah, and I would say the nation should kiss the sun. Rulers Absolutely, should. They, they should. They should. You know, all, all the world is accountable to the one true God. Amen. Christ. Christ rules over all. Where we disagree is which laws apply. Mm -hmm. that, that's one. Two. We disagree about what responsibility the government has. Gentiles governments have. Gentile governments have to enforce even moral law. Mm. And we haven't even, we haven't gotten into that really at all, but that's, that's kind of another question. That's not so much refuting theonomy. That's more of a positive articulation of the role of, of government, but we still believe God's law is supreme. You know, yes. Like, Amen. It's the norm that norms all norms, you know, but uh, we disagree with them about how to think about that. Yeah. Yeah. And if you were, if you were to go to almost any theonomist, at least any reformed theonomist and ask them is the is the um ceremonial law binding they would immediately say no of course not they have a category for there's an aspect of the old covenant that is not binding on us today right but there's a little bit of a disconnect and i think as you were as you were saying uh before pastor hicks uh that 
they view the judicial law in some sense as moral law because that's, right. um, that's, that's why they feel the need to, well, we've got to apply this in its entirety as it was, um, as it was given in the old covenant, because obviously if we view something as moral law, as, as transcendent, then we have to, we have to apply it. But we recognize, no, that's at least aspects of that are in the category of ab law that's been abrogated. That's, specifically only to that covenant amen that's why having a proper covenant theology and i think covenant theology touches more than just um you know whether babies should be baptized or not i mean we see this is a perfect example of that you have a wrong view of the covenants that god established and what they mean it can lead to uh false implications amen so um, kind of along those lines, do you think that this ties into um, a certain type of eschatology as well? Well, very often theonomists have been post-millennial reconstructionists. Uh, Greg Bonson, though, has he correctly pointed out that you do not have to hold to post-millennialism to be a theonomist. But others have also pointed out that they fit very well together, uh, Rush Dooney and North. Uh, of course, we're that way. Um, but postmillennial reconstructionists believe that, that Christ will first establish his earthly kingdom through the church during a future millennium before his return. And then after the kingdom, earthly kingdom is established in this figurative millennium. It's not necessarily a literal thousand years, but it's some period in which the kingdom of Christ is growing physically on earth, bodily on earth, you know, politically, socially, in every way. And after it's been fully established and the gospel and the law have conquered the whole world, every tribe and tongue, then Jesus will return and, uh, and he will sit uh, as king over his kingdom. Uh, it's called reconstructionism because they want to reconstruct Christendom, only go even further. So that's, you know, we've lost uh, cr Christianity in the West. We've lost you know, Western civilization, we want to reconstruct what's, what was right there. And we really want to even go further than that. Um, now th they say that they believe that Christ's kingdom will come through the preaching of the gospel and the conversion of sinners, but their main interest to me seem to lie in the political and political solutions to the problems of the world. So they'll give lip service. Yes, we believe in preaching the gospel for the conversions of, of sinners, but what they emphasize is overhauling the justice system, establishing Old Testament judicial law uh, to build God's kingdom on earth. And that they may not like me saying <clears throat> this, but at a, at a popular level, at least to me, they seem much more focused on how everybody else needs to change rather than being focused on their own hearts and their own need of Christ, their own need of the fruit of the spirit, need of humility, love for others, serving others as Christ has served them. And I really believe that their emphasis is the opposite of where our emphasis should be in the church. The church should not primarily be oriented to trying to get everyone else to change, the pagans to change so that God's kingdom will be built. But the church instead should be focused on growing in personal holiness and love and holding out Christ to, uh, to others, preaching the law and the gospel to them for their conversion of their souls and then loving them for Christ's sake. Yes, we should rebuke sin. But we should never imply that if our society would turn away from its sin, then we can build the kingdom of God through our change. That's, that's just, just wrong. It's a, also it's a fundamental misunderstanding of the nature of God's kingdom. Um, they they seem to think of the kingdom of God first in very external terms, but the Bible teaches that in this present age, the kingdom of God is fundamentally inward and spiritual. God administers His kingdom through the new covenant. And the new covenant is a believer's only covenant, a covenant of people who are willing subjects of the king because they're filled with his spirit. They have new hearts and the covenant people are the kingdom people. So it's a mistake to think that the kingdom of God could ever be identified with an earthly kingdom in this age. And the age to come, it will be an earthly kingdom upon the new earth, uh, but not in this age. And so Yes, an es eschatol eschatological perspective does tend to go along with uh, theonomy in our context. Although there are Baptist theonomists who don't hold to, and, and maybe perhaps Presbyterian ones who don't hold to post-millennialism, but they seem to go together.
Yeah, yeah. I mean, that it, it seems logically, it seems like the logical conclusion of theotomy. If you're trying to establish Christ's perfect kingdom here on earth, then it would make sense that you would want them to submit to the law of God in some sort of external sense. And then just, if you're just simply saying, well, let's preach the gospel, let's preach the gospel, but we're not seeing many turning to the gospel, that doesn't exactly bode well for your um, eschatology. Yeah. But. It is it is interesting um, contrasting how we see theonomists uh, interact or preach to the uh, the civil magistrate compared to how we um, see it in the Bible in the New Testament. Because obviously, I 100% I agree with you, Pastor Hicks, that when I look at theonomists and what they're doing, they're often preaching essentially the law to the civil government um talking like talking that this is this is what you need to be doing you need to be implementing god's law um but you contrast this with say paul in front of felix or paul in front of festus and it's all gospel Amen. he's trying to convert them he doesn't mention anywhere that oh no you should be implementing the civil law that's what you're supposed to be doing we have no example of that um, that's that's where, exactly right. Yeah. <laughs> Same with Romans 13. We don't see Paul telling Christians to overthrow the government that's there and establish some sort of biblical framework. They're to submit even to a pagan government that doesn't submit to God's law. That's um, right. Yeah. So, yeah, lots lots of good stuff here. Um, well, thank you, Pastor Hicks. We really appreciate you being on the show today. Uh, it's been yes. a blessing talking to you about this topic. It's an important topic. And one that I think is it's creeping its head back. Um, I think it, it kind of comes in waves, but it's starting to come back, I think, more of a force and even in, in Reformed Baptist circles. So I think it's an important discussion. But we appreciate mm -hmm. you being on the show, and uh, Lord bless you. It's been a joy God to be bless. here. God bless you, brothers, as well. Mm -hmm.